I got a talk tomorrow at 11.30 and the auditorium, I think, if anybody's interested in checking that out, because that's going to be a little bit more personal. That one's called My Path to the Decentralized Lifestyle. Uh, the majority of you guys in here already know about my work and what I'm about and all those kind of things. But um, that's going to be tomorrow. So today, this talk is called The Holistic Approach to Decentralization. And it's, it's been kind of cool already. I mean, the conference is just beginning, but going into this, I was maybe coming into this with the assumption that some of the people here, maybe the majority of people here, are just going to be focused on finance and um, economics and you know, how cryptocurrency can be an investment for them to raise their portfolio and get them rich and things of that sort. And I do think that's a part of, a, of cryptocurrency. It's a part of this, this space that we're working in. But it's also much bigger than that. And just, you know, I just came from the other room hearing, uh, was it Colin or? Yeah, Jim, I think, right? Jim, Jim Cantrell, who is, you know, him and his son, Colin, are behind this whole conference. And thank you to them and everybody who organized it. But hearing him speak as somebody who has experience in the space industry, in the intelligence industry, and basically being able to clearly say that for him, this is much bigger. Like he sees cryptocurrency, he sees Nexus as being the revolution that it has the potential to be. And that's what my talk is about uh, today. That's why I talk about holistic, uh, the holistic approach. Now, when, when I speak of holistic, it comes from the term holism, which is the philosophy of holism, which deals with looking at situations, whatever you're studying, whatever you're examining, and looking at the whole parts rather than the individual parts. So the term's fairly familiar to most people as um, holistic medicine. So when you think of holistic medicine, it's about treating the symptoms, treating the whole body rather than just the symptoms, right? Uh, holistic ecology is the study of the environment and humanity as a species together rather than separating them and breaking them down into different parts. So with that same view in mind, what I call holistic activism or more specifically holistic anarchism is about that, is about looking at all these different areas of our life, looking at uh, the economic area, looking at um, the, uh, our food, looking at our education, the way we educate ourselves, looking at um, our communication, the way we communicate with ourselves, the way we communicate with our business partners, our lovers, our friends, all these sort of things. And essentially just saying that it's not just about knowing these philosophies in and out and knowing you know, how to buy Bitcoin or Nexus and all these sort of things, but it's deeper than that, at least for me. And I feel like if we're ever truly going to achieve freedom, then we need to look beyond just those uh, surface levels. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. But before I get into that and look at each of those areas that I just went through, the economics, uh, food, education, uh, relationships, before we look at that, I want to explain a philosophy that is helpful for me that I've used and I employ in my everyday regular life to break free from this system, to find ways to do business, to exchange goods, to live a free lifestyle that's, that doesn't contribute to the systems and the problems that I don't agree with it. So when we were listening to Judge Napolitano this morning and to uh, Jim Cantrell talk about all the different systems that are going on and the problems, he talked about NSA spying, Judge Napolitano talked about uh, the court systems and national security letters and just the way that they are overstepping their bounds constantly and taking away our freedoms and working to limit the progress of humanity itself. When we look at those things, you know, we start to identify the problems. Okay, well, I don't like the surveillance. I don't like the wars. I don't like, you know, these various aspects. But it, I find, and I've found over the last seven years, that not many people ask themselves and stop and say, well, in which ways am I contributing to these things? Because, you know, we had a huge anti-war movement in 2003, 2004. Um, some of the numbers suggest that the biggest marches in, you know, recorded history took place in Europe and in America at the launch of the Iraq War in 2003 and 2004. Obviously, those marches, those protests didn't stop the wars. Those wars continue on to today. And, you know, think about what would have happened if those, I think they estimated, you know, three to four or five million people on a single day spread around the world doing that. What if those three, four or five million people had simply stopped paying taxes, had stopped using the Federal Reserve note, had, you know, cryptocurrency wasn't around yet, but had got invested into cryptocurrency and started using that as a medium of exchange. So they weren't contributing to the Federal Reserve or whatever central bank they're dealing with, and to the economic centers, uh, the power centers. And so that's, that's what I focus on is, I don't want to just talk about the problems or write about the problems. I'm a journalist, so that's, what, that's how I try to spread these ideas. But I don't want to just 
tell people the bad things that are going on. I like to talk about things that the problems that I see, but also present a solution. And one of those solutions is a philosophy known as agorism. And that's uh, agorism as in agora, which comes from Greek. It's uh, the word for the marketplace, basically. In ancient Athens, this was the marketplace. Imagine a hub sort of like we have here today where people are coming together to exchange goods. Um, they're exchanging political ideas, so there's debating going on. There's uh, you know, food being sold, all sorts of transactions, just this hub of activity of free people coming together without any Caesar, any emperor, any president, any authoritarian, getting in between them and telling them how to do that business. And the man who came up with this philosophy of agorism, his name was Samuel Konkin III, and he was an uh, activist in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. He died in 2004 before cryptocurrency came about. But the beautiful thing is a lot of the ideas he wrote about they're unfolding right now, including cryptocurrency. The things that he predicted would allow humanity, the ways that he believed technology would come into play and allow us to be more free in our lives, we're already seeing those things unfold today. So Agorism, he had this vision. He saw where we were at now, the status quo, and he's writing this in the 60s and the 70s, that we have a situation where we are limited by well, by a number of things, but specifically by statism and by the state itself. And the state tries to restrict, it, it tries to uh, obstruct and tries to impede, it tries to imprison, murder, you know, all these limiting, holding back our potential. While human ingenuity, what some would call the market, it promotes cooperation, it promotes growth, education, building, creation, all these wonderful things. And so Konkin saw the status quo, and he envisioned this future, what he called the Agora, where hum humanity would be able to come together to exchange ideas, goods, business, and do so without being obstructed by a third party. He wrote two short books about this. One is called The New Libertarian Manifesto, and one is called The Agoras Primer, that I, rec I recommend checking out. And so he, he envisioned, how do we get from where we are now towards this, this vision of this Agora, this free place? And he came up with a strategy that he called counter-economics. Counter-economics is simply, if we understand economics to be, or the market itself to be the sum of all human inter and interaction, right? Us coming together freely without third party involvement. That's the marketplace, right? Well, Konkin said counter-economics thus, and you gotta think about this, he was active in the 60s and 70s, so you had the counterculture, so that's why he called it counter-economics. There was like the new left movement, and he called this new libertarianism. He was trying to distinguish his movement from mainstream libertarianism and from other movements. So he used that terminology like that. So counter-economics is simply the sum of all human interaction, economic activity that the state considers to be illegal or illicit, you know, not preferred. They, it's stuff that they think is bad, basically. So let's say cannabis. You, know, you guys are here in Denver. You don't really have to deal with this much. But back home in Houston, back in Texas, if I was to get caught with you know, a plant, I would be arrested and thrown in a cage, right? Um, if I was to try to sell that plant to another person, to be an entrepreneur, to say, you know what, I, I want to provide a service. There are people in my community who want this plant. I'm going to grow it. I'm going to harvest it. I'm going to go uh, supply that product. I would be arrested, and I would be charged and put in a cage. Well, Konkin essentially encouraged as many people as possible for all of us to to use this method as a form of civil disobedience. So rather than when the state says, hey, this is illegal, you can't uh, mow somebody's lawn without a permit. You can't get a haircut without a permit. You can't open up a lemonade stand. What's the most recent one that went viral? You can't have a hot dog stand without making sure to get a permit, right? So Conkin said there are these areas in, in uh, the economic activity, what he called the black and gray markets. The white market is the traditional market. This is where you're using the Federal Reserve note. You've got a taxable income. You're depositing your check in the bank. There's records of it. That's the white market that the majority of the the average person deals in. Konkin said, let's move our economic activity as well as our moral support and our political action away from that mainstream economy and redirect it into the black and the gray markets. Gray markets are something that every single person uh, that I've found in my experience uses on some level. They just might not realize the power behind it. So this is the yard sale. This is the garage sale. This is paying the neighbor to mow the lawn for you know, some cash exchange, getting a haircut without a license. It's anything that the state would prefer you to get a permit a license, a slip, of, a per permission slip, basically, is what it is. It comes down to it. Uh, they want you to get a permission slip to do whatever they, they say, uh, whatever kind of activity you want. And of course, you imagine a, a time before the state existed, before they had complete and total control of our lives, we just chose to do what we wanted to do. If I wanted to provide a service, uh, whether that's a food product or 
um, you know, wh whatever it may be, I chose to do that and anybody who wanted to participate could come to me and then two free people come together and they interact and that was the goal. So that's the gray market. Konkin said, what we need to do is to take our, instead of feeding into these systems and giving them our money and paying their licenses and paying their regulations and paying their fees, which then goes to contribute to the wars, the surveillance, and all the things that we don't like, even the things that you might like that are being funded involuntarily through forced taxation, if we take that money away from them and we redirect that into our communities, we could actually start to create you know, the agora that he was envisioning and creating these pockets of counter-economic activity. So that's the gray market. That's, again, basic stuff that most people do on the, the regular basis. You know, if you ever go to a garage sale, if you ever go to um, a yard sale or anything like that, or anytime you do business with another person and there's no third party taking taxes out of that and taking fees out of that that are then going to be redirected into the state, that's the gray market. That's the first step, the first stage. The black market is stuff that the state actually considers to be illegal. So this is when you're you're being the cannabis dealer, or the weapons smuggler, or consensual and voluntary prostitution, or anything, again, that the state is trying to dictate what is moral, what is uh, right, and say, you can't do that, that's illegal. We choose civil disobedience, and we do it anyways. We choose civil dis disobedience, and we don't get the permit, and we don't get the license, and we say, well, the state thinks it's illegal for me to sell my buddy a plant, or to, um, you know, provide somebody with a service that they think is incorrect, I'm going to do it anyways. So what that does, it's taking away that fi financial support from them. Because you're now creating economic activity, counter-economic activity. You're in, the, in this market, there's exchanges happening, there's goods that are being processed, there's money being made, but none of it is going towards the state. The institution that I believe most of the people here at this conference understand is a part of the problem we're facing. The reason we have Nexus and the reason we're trying to go to space and you know, get free internet all over the world and, and help give people information. And, um, and you know, when you read the, the incoming uh, bulletin board up there about what this conference is about, it's really about recognizing that the state is what's limiting us and getting in our way. And if you recognize that, then we can't sit back and just say, okay, well, I know the state's a problem. I'm not gonna vote for those people. Um, you know, I'm not gonna support them in this way. I'm just gonna get a bunch of cryptocurrency. It's about doing more than just cryptocurrency, doing more than just finances and economics. The counter-economic activity is just the start. That's what I feel is like the first step in that direction. And that's when you get invested into Bitcoin or Nexus and other things, because that's, that's the fullest extension of the Agorist philosophy. The first step is, again, you're taking your money away from them. You're doing business that doesn't involve licenses and fees. The next step is you're doing business, if you choose to, that they consider to be illegal, but is just two free people coming together. The fullest extension of this would be to be doing your business without using the state's currency. Not using the Federal Reserve, no, because every time that we choose to traffic in that market and use the Federal Reserve note, we're supporting the Federal Reserve system and what it represents and the wars that they finance through the taxation and through that currency and through all the other means that they have. So agorism, agorism is just about that. It's that philosophy that says we can achieve this agora, this future, this vision of a free society where people can come together and choose to do business and interact and exchange ideas how they please without the state being involved. And we can choose to do that by consciously and proactively taking our money and our finances and our moral support, because it's not just the money. I mean, that's a big part. Obviously, we all understand the importance of, finance, uh, of the financial uh, control that they have through the Federal Reserve System. But I think it also goes towards the moral support of the system as well. And that's where I get into the holistic approach that I'm going to cover in just a moment. At the end of the day, though, the Agorist message is simply saying that we can achieve a free society once we stop paying their taxes, once we stop using their currency, once we stop giving into that system. Because as long as we continue to play by those rules, you know, the system's going to be there. So for those who came to Nexus or who might be here because they believe that Nexus is going to be the next big thing that they can get rich off of, or you know, they want to buy in at Bitcoin at the right time when it's dipping, or you know, I have no issue with you making money or trying to make money. I, we all need wealth. I think there's a lot more wealth to be gained than material wealth. But I want you to take a moment, excuse me, I got a cough drop, I've been sick. I want you to take a moment to really think about how this is bigger than just money. It's bigger than just finance. It's bigger than just growing your pocketbook. I personally am invested. The reason I'm here, the reason I got invited as a speaker is because I've been touring the country as part of a tour that I call the Decentralize Your Life Tour. 
spreading this exact message. Those are my books if anybody wants to check them out. My life, my time, my energy is dedicated to trying to change the world in the same way that Jim Cantrell was over there talking about why he's here. You know, he didn't create Nexus. They didn't organize this conference so we could just, for lack of a better term, come here and have a circle jerk. They wanted to create new ideas, innovation that can actually propel people forward. So I want to challenge everyone to think deeper than just, you know, this is about uh, finances. It's just, it's about cryptocurrency for sure. That's just one facet of it though. And this brings me to the holistic uh, message here. And if you can see this symbol here, now again, I said I'm an anarchist, so I, I, it says holistic anarchism, and I'll explain a little bit about that. But in general, the holistic approach, I think it works no matter whether you identify as an anarchist or not. So let me explain a little bit of what I mean about that. And what I said as far as holistic, it comes from the philosophy of holism. Again, dealing in whole parts rather than individual systems. So we take the full thing into scope. So when I step back and I look at the problems that we have today in the world, I don't just see, okay, well, the Federal Reserve is, you know, has economic control. I see that. But then I also see a food production system that is completely unsustainable, that we are all dependent upon. You know, I'm, I mean, I'm from Houston. We just got done dealing with hurricanes and people without power. And, you know, you quickly see how unprepared people are for life that is not dependent on either the government or the electric grid or, you know, you see the grocery stores empty out. Like, this is, these are real world scenarios that are playing out right before us. And I think it's, a, it's an opportunity to recognize that we have to get beyond this dependency. And that's what the holistic message is about. So I don't just see problems in the Federal Reserve. I don't just see problems with the food production system. I see a lot of problems in the education system. I, I read an article yesterday, what was it, like eight-year-old kid strapped down and forced to be injected with something at a public school. And then like every week, you know, it's some new story about a little kid in public school getting, uh, you know, abused or uh, punished because they won't say the Pledge of Allegiance. And there you go again. This is just reinforcing the state's view of things. You, they put the children in the public schools. They have them stand to say the Pledge of Allegiance. And they create a mindset that worships authority. So it's problematic to keep sending our children into those institutions. And then also, I see, um, I see individuals such as myself who are striving for this change. But then I recognize that, well, maybe, maybe you know, you've got off the Federal Reserve note and you got away from cryptocurrency and you're eating better and you're, you're growing your own food and these kind of things. And, you know, you've got homeschooling or unschooling going on and you're self-educated through the Internet. But maybe you're a piece of shit. Maybe in your personal relationships, you exercise authoritarian and violent communication and you've never looked into nonviolent communication. Uh, you're not treating yourself very nice and you're not treating your spouse, your friends, your business partners. I think that's just as important, equally important, if not more important, than to understanding the philosophies and the politics behind all these scenarios. You know, you can know the ins and outs, the daily ins and outs of what Donald Trump's up to or what bill's being voted on, or you could have read every single, uh, you know, cryptocurrency volume out there and every sort of uh, libertarian philosophy out there, but still not be right inside, you know? And this is where, again, the holistic message, my, my work focuses on not just the physical manifestation, the physical struggle for a more free world, but also the internal, uh, personal struggle that we each face. Because I do believe that there is a lot of pain and a lot of suffering and healing that is needed in our world. And until, until we address that deeper root level of it, I don't think we're going to be able to get to where we want to go, which is a free world, I believe. I think that's why we're coming here to talk about Nexus. We're all really excited about the potential for what they can create here. We're coming here to learn. Um, so let me go a little bit deeper in that. So the economics, of course, we start with cryptocurrency. I already mentioned the Federal Reserve System, system of debt and enslavement through the dollar. Inflation, a hidden tax, continues to lose value. So obviously promoting and actually using and employing, not just investing, but using on a regular basis, uh, cryptocurrency, be it Bitcoin, Nexus, Dash, Ethereum, um, what have you, or even if you're not using crypto, maybe, you know, because I have a lot of people say, well, what happens when the internet dies, Derek, or when the power goes out, you know, and these are all, again, possible scenarios. So um, it's also good to maybe traffic or in, in invest in and in learning about localized currencies and local alternative currencies. Those can be paper currencies like cash, because there still is value in cash, not in the Federal Reserve note, but in cash, which is essentially, it's another on tracked exchange. You know, it's a good medium of exchange. That's also why we see the state wanting to go in the direction of a cashless society. Um, so if we're going to think holistically about the economic side of the equation, we need to think about um, how are we using 
cryptocurrency? How are we using localized currencies or barter networks and promoting these things, creating them, being the innovators that actually do it? Because the, the way I see things is we can either just keep passing this down generation to generation. I tend to think and take in the principle of the seventh generation, and I think about not just what my possible children might deal with and their children, but seven generations down the line. How are my actions or my inactions going to affect them um, when they come about? And am I just going to be passing it down to them? So uh, this is an important thing. You know, as part of the tour, the Decentralize Your Life tour, we toured the whole country. We've been to like 40 cities so far uh, bringing this message. And we did the whole thing using the BitPay debit card. I'm sure some of you guys are familiar with it. You know, we loaded our, our Bitcoin wallet the card directly to that, and then we took that money, we paid for all our gas while we traveled, using the Bitcoin that was on the card, paid for all our food, everything. You know, we just did it completely decentralized and not reliant on the state system. I don't think it's perfect. I do think there's some, some things, some kinks that could be worked out. Obviously, to me, the next stage of that would just be to be able to go to businesses and give them Bitcoin directly. I mean, and there's, that ecosystem is, is here already. I mean, my books are for sale for Bitcoin, all that kind of stuff, but we need more wide scale adoption. <laughs> I will say this, I just saw earlier this week, the first realtor company in Texas just sold their, uh, their first home bought completely in Bitcoin. You know, it was the first company in Texas to do that. So there's progress being made and it, it needs to continue to happen if we're ever gonna actually see full scale adoption of these things. So that's the economic side of things. Um, then we talk about uh, food. I bring in food because, well, we all need food to survive, but it's very important to think about, think holistically about the way that we acquire our food. I think it's important to look at your diet. Um, I think it's important to also, again, look at the, the supply chain because the supply chain that currently exists for the average American is it's being grown, your food's being grown in California or Mexico, maybe some smaller local farms, depending on where you're at, and it's being shipped thousands of miles around the country to make it to your local grocer and then to make it to your plate, right? So what happens when those supply chains break down? Like when there's a drought in California or for whatever reason, that food can get to your grocery store. Like all of a sudden you're in a situation where you're out of luck. Like, you know, this is a situation, the scenario we've seen where people are like, let's take Venezuela, for example. You've got like long food lines, you've got looting and rioting and people are trying to do what they have to do just to survive. Why do they have to go loot and riot? because they didn't think ahead, they weren't proactive, they didn't actually stop and take the time and think, there might be a point in the future where I need to be independent and not dependent on these systems. I'm asking us to do that now, to think ahead and to start planning for what may come about in the future um, and how we can, I guess, how we can really survive, not just, not just survive, but thrive through these situations. So this, in order to get past these unsustainable uh, food distribution systems, the easy answer, the most simple answer, I think, is to grow your own food when possible. And uh, I have an agorist business that I have back in Houston um, where we, you know, we build gardens for people. We do it, again, without paying taxes or anything like that. So maybe you can have somebody come build you a garden. Um, you can just invest in, in learning, giving yourself that education because it's such a huge, valuable tool to be able to grow your own food. But there's also so many community farms, community uh, gardens out there that even if you put in one day a week on the weekend with you and your kids or your, your spouse to just go learn a little bit about taking care of yourself and putting, you know, seeds to me are the most valuable currency and those are always going to be them. I have, you know, I've invested heavily in seeds because I believe that when, when it comes down to it and if the internet does go down, the electricity goes down, I don't think I'm going to be able to get anybody to accept a Bitcoin. And if people are hungry, I don't think they're going to care about how many gold bars or silver bars I have. But if I've got seeds, if I've got tools, then they will be able to, we'll be able to exchange things. And not only that, I see that by me learning about gardening and, you know, I live in Houston in the Freethinker House. It's a community space where I live with uh, two of my buddies and we have a community garden there. So we host community garden days and we'll have a whole bunch of people from around the city who just want to come get involved. They spend a few hours in our garden. They're welcome to come eat whatever they want out of the crops that we plant. And, you know, for the last year, I've been able to get all of my greens out of my backyard rather than going and spending that money, again, on those unsustainable food production systems. And also, when you look a little bit deeper into it, you can also see that, um, you know, there's statism involved in, in supporting these unsustainable food production systems as well. And these, um, these, the violence, that's the other thing I want to address here when we're talking about food. Not just, the, I've talked now about the unsustainability of the food distribution systems. You know, it's, it's coming from one place. It's being flown or, or driven thousands of miles. So if that breaks down, that's an obvious weakness. We need to address that. 
I would also suggest that, you know, looking into your diet, um, and, you know, I'm a vegan, but I'm not here to be a militant vegan and to preach to people and tell them you need to adopt a vegan diet. But I do think there's merit to and in looking into that and to seeing the violence that is inherent in, the, in that system. And even if you are a meat eater, um, the factory farming, industrial farming system is just, is just disgusting. It's horrible. So if you choose to eat meat, then, you know, not everybody can go hunt it themselves, so I understand. But there's more and more localized farms, and, and some of them are just greenwashing. You know, they're full of shit, and they're just going to say, like, oh, yeah, cage-free. And, you know, that means that they get to run in, like, a 20 by 20 area or something like that. So, but there's, what I'm getting at is there's more opportunity now to go to a farm and to visit and say, hey, like, I'm going to go meet the cattle that I'm going to be eating. Like, at the least, have the courage to look at the animal in the face and... Uh, when you're going to eat it and at least go see it. And you're like, okay, these are the farmers. I know they don't use antibiotics here. They're not using chemicals and things that I don't want in my food. I feel good about buying from them and I'm supporting a local business as opposed to these huge, just disturbing, disgusting factory farming um, industries out there. And I don't think I really need to elaborate upon that. I'm sure everybody's very, oh, if you're not, then like all you need to do is go watch a PETA video or something. Or I mean, there's, there's hundreds of them out there, unfortunately. Um, so that's again to me, and what is you may be thinking? What the heck does that have my diet have to do with cryptocurrency or with Nexus or why I didn't come here to hear about food? Well, again, taking it from a holistic perspective, if you are only you know unplugging economically and you're investing in the economic systems and the cryptocurrencies and alternative currencies, but in your daily habits and you're you're still supporting systems that are not only violent but dependent on statism and unsustainable then I think that's also problematic. And it's for me, it's not going far enough. I want to completely break free from these systems and all systems of oppression and violence, not just the state. Um, education, this is something I think everybody here is probably fairly well versed in. Uh, like Jim was saying in the other room, you know, he decided in the early 80s when, that he thought he needed to get an education to get out of his situation. And he said, well, at that time, it just the only options you had were, I'm going to go to university, get a degree, and then hopefully I get a job. Those of us, though, who have grown up in the age of the internet, we recognize that there are things like YouTube University, which is what I just, I mean, how many people here in this room have ever troubleshooted something by going to YouTube? You know, like you couldn't figure out how to do something, you go look, I mean, everybody's, that's just, that's, it's YouTube University. That's the beauty of the decentralized peer-to-peer -peer, um, living, is that we get to, we, re we realize, oh, wow, I just figured out how to do this skill. Maybe other people could benefit from me filming it and loading it to the internet for other people. And then we help each other and we all grow through that. So you have YouTube University. You've also got the Khan Academy. Um, another one I would recommend checking out is edx.org, edx.org. This is a beautiful, beautiful website. It's, um, it's college level classes and all sorts of classes that are taught by university professors from Berkeley, you know, all over the, the top level professors, Yale professors, Berkeley professors. I've taken journalism classes through edx. And you can take anything you want from physics to mathematics to journalism to arts for free at your own pace, taught by a university professor. You know, it's very, and you can pay a little extra if you want to get a certificate to show somebody, you know, put that on your resume. But the point is that we have the opportunity now to educate ourselves and the children and the people who are growing up. Um, I remember life before the internet. I'm 32, so I remember you know, what it was like before, and now things are just so much easier. There's so much more opportunity for a decentralized education, whether it's YouTube University, Khan Academy, edx.org, or simply the social media interaction that we have that allows us to learn from other people from all over the world. I mean, that itself is, is a huge educational experience. You know, instead of just being closed in with maybe the 50 or so people in your town that you interact on a regular basis, now you're learning from people who live completely different ways in other countries and other parts of the world. And that's, I think, been instrumental in allowing us to build empathy and to build um, bonds. And that's where I'm gonna, it's going to lead me to the final point, which is um, the, taking the holistic approach to our very self, our relationships it's, itself. So not just the economics, the food, education. And there's, a bigger, there's, there's much more to this decentralized uh, process. But when it comes to our relationships, I think this is the big point. Because as I said earlier, there's a lot of healing in our world that needs to take place. There are, um, there are individuals who are traumatized, who, are, you know, who have PTSD and may not even realize it from simply dealing with life in, under a state or from going to fight in the state's wars or maybe from the awareness that they are constantly being surveyed in every action that they take. You know, I mean, there's so many different forms and ways that people are dealing with trauma, not, not to mention their own, 
like maybe their own personal upbringing or their environment, things of that sort. So when you have a world of people who are imbalanced and we're all coming together, right? We're looking at the problems. We, we can easily identify the problems because when you're not right inside, it's very easy to project. I found in my experience as somebody who's struggled a lot with drug addiction and depression and suicide in the past, that it's very easy when you are not good inside to, to project outwards. And so I was the kind of person that talk shit about everything in the world. It's just like, I could tell you everything that was wrong with things going on in the world because that's all I was seeing. I didn't want to look into myself and see what was happening here. I think that's one of the biggest steps is not only to identify the problems that we see in the world, but then to look, and this is, again, the holistic part, to ask, okay, well, in which ways am I contributing to that? I don't like when people tell me about the violence happening in the factory farms, but every day I'm at my grocer buying from those industries. I don't like that the Federal Reserve note is funding these wars and taxation, inflation, all these things, but every day I'm using the Federal Reserve note, and I still haven't looked up Bitcoin or Nexus. I still haven't gotten involved, even though all my friends keep telling me about it. Um, you know, I don't like that I have to send my children to the public school where they could be forced to, to do Pledge of Allegiance and all kinds of things or abused by the authorities, but I haven't taken any time to look into what are my options for self-education, for home education. So this message, this idea is simply saying, rather than constantly projecting outwards and looking towards the problems, how are we going to address our own shortcomings and our own, our own contributions to the problems that we see? Because that is where the, the struggle is, is really going to be won. Um, I call my, my book series and, and my work and my website, it's The Conscious Resistance. And what I mean by that phrase, The Conscious Resistance, is simply an, an awareness, a realization that the struggle for a more free ethical world is both one in the, the physical world against uh, government oppression, against uh, bigotry and all kinds of you know, horrible things that exist out here, but it's also that struggle that takes place in here, in our own hearts and minds. So that's what my message is, is about. That's why we're, ta we're focusing on these things, because we do play a role. You can stop and look at your own, your own actions, uh, and you can see, well, I am contributing to the problem in this way or in this way. And this is, this is leading me to uh, the next project that I'm working on that my buddy Sterling here, who will be speaking later, this is a project that we're both working on. Um, and it's in my, my last book, Manifesto of the Free Humans, it just came out a few months ago. Everything you're hearing today comes from that book, basically. Um, my co-author and I, basically we write that in order for us to really change these things, all these things that I've been addressing, we need for each individual to take an honest self-assessment is what we call it, like a uh, self-evaluation, to look at all these different areas and to look at our own lives and say, well, and, and to identify the inconsistencies because I'm all about consistency and being principled. Like both Judge Napolitano and Jim Cantrell po pointed out, we need people who are all about first principles, who are willing to die for them, you know, who are willing to live for them every day and to be about them, not just to come to conferences. Because I speak at a lot of conferences and sometimes I just feel like, are we really trying to change the world? Or are we all just like want to visit cool places and have talks and hang out and you know, schmooze around for a few days? Like, I want to change the world, man. Like, I would like to see some very radical changes to this world by the end of my life. I don't want to just come here and, and as I said, have this like stroking each other's ego kind of thing. So the self-evaluation, the honest self-assessment, is basically it, what we hope it will be um, as we're working on it. I'm going to give you guys a sample of how I've been developing it. But basically, in, in the end of the book, we say, in order for people to be able to you know, achieve these things, we need to take this honest self-assessment and look at each area of our lives in order to see where our inconsistencies are, to identify them, and then to rectify them. Now, when we wrote that, to me, in my mind, I know what I mean when I say that, but I've been rereading it as we've been touring the country and realizing, well, maybe it's sort of vague. Maybe people aren't going to truly understand what I mean by that. So I'm going to give you a preview of what this self-assessment is in my mind at this point, and I'm sure it will evolve over time. But it's going to be a, a really simple handbook, like a workbook, that you can take the time to write in and to draw in, and I hope that people will really spend time and, and energy on this and see it as something of value. But so imagine you have this workbook, and when you open the first page, there's, there's a space that says, uh, who are you, right? And there's a space for you to write your name, first name, full name, nickname, whatever, because that's usually how we answer that question. Who are you? Like, oh, my name, right? But then I would invite people to, underneath their name, to spend some time writing down the characteristics and the attributes that make up who they are, right? So think about everything that you identify as yourself. Like, you're okay, well... Uh, I'm a human being, I'm a journalist, you know, people start writing down our job titles, maybe you realize that, oh, I put a lot of emphasis on who I am based on my job, like if I lost that job, I'd feel like I'm nothing, you know, or if I lost this relationship, I'd feel like I lost my identity, and you start to realize that 
many of us have placed our identities on external objects, not really on who we are individually. So that first step is really going to be instrumental. Who, who are you? Who am, who am I? And, you know, I want people to write down the attributes of how they view themselves. Do you have a negative view of yourself? Do you have a positive view of yourself? Um, and so spend some time on that first process. And then you turn the page. So the second page at the top would have um, your goals. So you'd have short-term and long-term goals, right? So what is a goal? A goal is something that you want to experience. It's an, it's an object you want to possess, an experience you want to have. It's something you want to bring towards yourself, right? So you identify your short-term, long-term goals. Short-term goals could be very simple, basic things like, uh, you know, one of the examples I typically give, because it seems like it's easy for people to understand is, you know, maybe you're, you're somebody who said, okay, I want to I wanna lose 10 pounds by the end of the summer so I can feel good going to the beach, right? Um, you know, it could be other things like, okay, short term, I want to get this new job, I want to get this car. You know, then you think long term. Long term, you're thinking, okay, well, um, I want to leave my children a better world than I have. Uh, I want to get my own land. I'd like to have a homestead or I want to be a millionaire, whatever. You're thinking short term and long term goals. So after you identify, spend some time identifying your short term and long term goals, beneath that, you would have uh, your principles. So what is a principle? A principle is something that's supposed to guide us in our every action that we take, our thoughts, you know, our words, and obviously the actions. Um, and for me, one of these principles is you know, the self-ownership principle, sometimes known as the non-aggression axiom or the non-aggression principle, which essentially just means, this is again why I call myself an anarchist, because I think that each of you here own yourself. You have chosen to, as the vehicle of whoever you are, to come here and be here and listen to me speak right now. You did that all on your own. I didn't force anybody to be here. And you are choosing to share space with me right now. I believe in the value of self-ownership and its ability to help people, lead people towards freedom. Once we recognize that we all own ourselves, then the implication of that is, okay, well, if I own myself and if it's wrong for me to enforce my view on anybody else, well, then so do they. They all own themselves. And so you see that it's a reciprocal principle. We all own ourselves. Thus, it's wrong to force other people to do uh, what we think they should do. You know, and this is what gets into like what Judge Napolitano was talking about, more, um, legislating morality, how people try to do that. And they try to tell us, the busybodies try to tell us how to live our lives, and they use government as the tool to do that. So uh, a principle should be something that guides you in your everyday action. Mine is the non-aggression principle, the non-aggression axiom, and then again, what I mentioned earlier, another principle that's important to me is the seventh generation principle, thinking about how my actions take place, uh, take effect, and, and who they will affect down the, the line. And I want to say this, just a quick side note. If you guys haven't noticed in the, the tent where they've got the food, like big props later if you're seeing this, Jim and all the organizers, for putting compostable options in there. Like I've been to a lot of conferences, and one of my big things, because I'm thinking holistically, is like, okay, we're here, we're spreading a message, but everything, look at all this trash we just produced. Look at all this waste that's just going to go into a landfill. So if you don't notice, there's two trash cans over there. The one on the right is compostable. I don't think anybody's noticed that yet. But the, and all the silverware and stuff they have there is compostable. It's recyclable. That's cool. That to me is taking the holistic approach into, you know, not just thinking we want to do a big conference, but let's save some money by bringing in the crap. It's like, no, bring it all in. Like, so those are the principles that guide me. Self-ownership, seventh generation. What I hope is that people will stop and spend some time and think about what are the principles that guide you. And what you find often, though, is that the average person doesn't even know what a principle is, much less what principles they have. So if you're not in tune with your own self and if you don't know what principles you have, then you're just making decisions every single day. And often those decisions conflict with each other because you're just you're all over the place, right? And this is how politicians come along every two to four to eight years, and they're able to guide people like, hey, you know, this party, it seems like they want, they have my interest at heart. And maybe it's this party over here. And you've got people just swaying back and forth and, and getting caught up in this. And they're not, they're not rooted in themselves. They're not rooted in the principles that guide them. Um, and so, again, this would be important to uh, get to know your principles. So again, the first page, who are you? Who am I? Get to know yourself on a deeper level. Second page, what are my goals, short term and long term? And then below that, what are my principles? You turn the page. Now on the third page, we start out with um, habits, I think. Yeah, are, are your habits. So this is, this is where it gets good. This is where, as I was saying earlier, the goal of this, my goal is to actually help people, guide them through a process to be able to identify their inconsistencies and then hopefully be motivated to, to change. Because once you start looking at your habits, what is a habit? Habit is like your daily routine, your vices, your thoughts, like everything that you do on a regular basis, right? So you start writing down your habits, okay? 
And again, this is where you can see the inconsistencies. If back on page two where you said your short-term goal was to lose 10 pounds so that you could go to the beach and feel good about yourself, but then you look at your habits and you're sleeping until 5 p.m. every day and you're eating Hostess cakes and pizza all the time, that's an obvious inconsistency. You will not achieve that goal, right? And if on your long-term goals you're saying, I want to create a world free of oppression, I want to create a world free of government, or I want to leave my children uh, a, you know, a better world where the environment is not destroyed, but then you look at your habits and your actual actions and you don't see any steps towards that, then you're never going to get there. Again, if you know, on the, the recyclable, compostable stuff. If you're talking about you want to you know, help the planet or you know, want to leave this beautiful, pristine place better than we found it, but then in our daily actions, we're just throwing trash all over the ground every day or we're just polluting or we're not even thinking in these terms, we are never going to achieve those goals. So it doesn't matter how much cryptocurrency we invest in, how, you know, or you know, which philosophies we understand, which politicians we know, all these sort of things that are part of it, but they're not the full picture. So until we... Um, are willing to do that, I, I think that we're going to have some trouble. So this is where the habits will do that. This will allow us to start looking at your habits and do your habits align with your stated short-term and long-term goals. And if they don't, this is not, you know, this, again, this is going to be a handbook that I think will be released probably in the next few months with uh, me and Sterling. And it'll, it'll just be meant for an individual to read it, to work through it, to spend some time on it, and hopefully to be motivated to say, you know what, I actually do want to achieve these goals because as I said already, I don't want to just keep coming to conferences for the rest of my life and, you know, getting patted on the back and people telling me they appreciate my work. Like, it's all meaningless if it doesn't achieve anything. You know, it doesn't matter to me to, to come here and to keep having these celebrations and fancy drinks and hotels and all. It's all nice. All the trappings and things are nice to, to, this, to this life. But I actually do want to achieve change. I actually do want to help people on the path towards a decentralized, more free, liberated lifestyle. And the, uh, the final thing I'll mention, this is just the first three pages of this workbook. I don't know how long it's going to be, maybe 10 pages or so. The cool thing is Sterling, who was sitting there a moment ago, um, he, has a, he comes from a psychology background. So what he's going to do, his role in this project is going to help me, after we lay out this process where people can identify their inconsistencies, we're going to put some information in there that can help people maybe identify, well, why do you have these inconsistencies? You know, because it's not, I don't think it's just enough to say if there's an inconsistency, let's fix it, right? Well, it might reappear later if you don't address the root cause of it, right? So maybe there's a reason you're inconsistent. Maybe there's a reason you have trouble living up to your full potential. Because my goal is I want to encourage every individual to live up to their fullest potential to be the best version of themselves, you know? And so we're really hoping, um, and now that I have Sterling's help, that we can bring in this self-assessment and guide people to identifying their inconsistencies and then through Sterling's help maybe get them to see what is the root cause of these inconsistencies where do they come from why am I not living up to my full potential and this gets to the final part, part of what I'm going to share with you on this handbook which is our relationships again for, every, for the people who are just walking in um, my message is holistic it's you know again I'm an anarchist so I say holistic anarchism but you can say holistic activism or you can just try to think of your actions in a whole in terms of holistic holistic comes from holism dealing in whole parts rather than individual pieces so we've been talking about looking at the economics looking at the unsustainable food production systems looking at uh, education and applying decentralization there and also our personal relationships and that's where I want to end after we take people through this workbook and guide them through the process of identifying their inconsistencies. I think the most important element of this is going to be helping them see where they are inconsistent in their personal relationships. As I said earlier, we can know everything we want about Bitcoin, Nexus. You can even, all the steps I just outlined, you can take all those steps, but at the end of the day, if you are still communicating in an authoritarian way and you're not you know, taking the time to uh, learn about tools like nonviolent communication, has anybody ever heard of nonviolent communication here? So for those who are unfamiliar, Marshall Rosenberg, look him up. Uh, look, just look up nonviolent communication. You'll find out everything you need to know. But basically, he recognized that the reason most conflicts arise is when individuals re, uh, feel like their needs are not being met. You know, so you have two people going back and forth, and maybe they're arguing. They're talking past each other, right? But at the root of it is one person, maybe they don't feel like they're being heard. You know, and so they, because they don't feel like they're being heard, they may be more likely to lash out to use what he called uh, jackal language and uh, jackal behavior. So this is intrinsic to what I'm, what I'm talking about here because I want to find ways to communicate about these tools and to do it in a holistic way and to do it in a compassionate way. I want to have empathy for people that some would consider to be 
enemies of these ideas. You know, I want to have empathy for the people who believe that the state is the answer, who believe centralization is the answer, who believe that the status quo as we have it now is, is all good and, and fine. I want to have empathy for them and compassion for them so that I can learn to communicate with them. I also want to have empathy and compassion, and I practice empathy and compassion for myself. So when I look back on my path and I recognize like, wow, okay, I'm talking about these lofty ideals and these big goals, but I haven't even always you know, lived up to this message. Even today, like as I've been doing this tour and doing my own personal self-assessment, I've been able to identify my own inconsistencies and see the areas that I need to work on so that I can elevate myself and be, you know, uh, an example of this message. So that's going to be the, the, the final part that I'm going to go over in that handbook. But look for that. It's just going to be called Honest Self-Assessment, or maybe we'll come up with a better, better title for that. But we're working on that. That is going to be out in the next few months, and that's a tool that I, I hope will be able to guide people to see that it's not just the struggle for for freedom and for a more ethical world is not just about investing in Bitcoin or investing in Nexus. It's about changing everything that we're doing. It's about applying decentralization to the way that we grow our food, and the way we get our food, to the way we educate ourselves, and to the way that we communicate with each other, to uh, you know the economics, all of these things. And if you're interested in in those uh, ideas, my books are here. I'm here the next couple days. Like I said, they're available for Bitcoin or Nexus, um, and everything I discussed came out of my most recent book. But um, other than that, I, I'm talking tomorrow at 11.30 in the auditorium where I'll be giving a more personal talk about this journey that I've been through. I kind of mentioned briefly that I had struggled with drug addiction and, and with uh, depression and suicide, and that's actually what led me to decentralization and to these answers. So my talk tomorrow is going to be called My Path to the Decentralized Lifestyle, if you're interested in that. But I do want to end the way I, I always try to end. And that's with uh, another tool that was helpful for me in my journey um, towards this path. And that is what is sometimes known as positive affirmations. And essentially, we have to recognize that every single day when we wake up, from the moment we wake up to the moment we go to sleep, there is somebody vying for this space in our head. They're mining our minds, trying to get in our head. Whether that's the corporate advertising, the ad playing on the YouTube video you're watching, I'm trying to get in your head right now. You know, somebody's always trying to get it in your head. But this is, again, going back to why it's important to know your principles and to be rooted in those principles. Because then you can, from that rooted place, you can take an in information and say, okay, well, eh, it doesn't really fit with what I know to be right. I'll cast that aside. Instead of being somebody who isn't principled and isn't rooted in themselves and is being led astray all the time. So for me, as I struggled with my addiction and prison and getting myself out of all that and coming to this path, um, one of the things I had to do was to relearn and reteach myself in my personal conversation. You know, I talk about the relationship stuff. It's not also about, it's again about empathy and compassion towards other people, but it's empathy and compassion towards ourselves. So in that path, I was uh, very, very, very negative towards myself often and put a lot, of, um, a lot of weight on myself. And so I had to spend years relearning that and retraining my mind so that every time I made a simple mistake or did something wrong, I didn't just say, God, you're such a dumbass, and beat myself up for you know, half the day. I had to relearn and, and, and teach myself better things. And positive affirmations were one of the tools that helped me with that. So if you feel inclined for those who are in the room and want to participate, you can repeat after me, and then I'm, I'm done for today. But uh, if, you, if you want to repeat, I am powerful. I am beautiful. I am free. Thank you guys for your time. I think I got three minutes if anybody's got a question. If not, thank you guys for your time. All right. Sure. Well, that's, I'm glad you asked that. Thank you. Um, it's been really great because, so we did two weeks across Texas where we're from. We did five weeks West Coast and Midwest. And in two weeks, we're headed to the East Coast again. And I've been making a deliberate effort the past six months of my work to not focus on like the niche crowd that already gets this message. And so along the tour, we've been talking to Green Party people, Libertarian Party people, Zeitgeist Movement, like a whole range of people, politically active people and people who are done with politics. And they all seem to get this message. Like I've talked to people about like, hey, well, let's just stop putting our energy into the system and let's use this counter-economic strategy and build something better. Let's decentralize. And across the spectrum, people, I mean, we're talking to right out of high school, going into college age people to 60, 70, 80 year old grandmas who are like, yeah, I'm an anarchist. Like they might not publicly say it or, you know, wear the shirt or proclaim it, but they get the principle. And that's what I care. I don't care if people wear the labels. If you understand self-ownership, if you understand the value in 
decentralization, then we're already on the process. We're already on the way, you know. So then it's just a matter of helping them see that the tools already exist. I, I didn't really go in depth today, but I mean, a lot of the tools already exist for us to do that. One other thing I didn't mention that I do want to mention: if you guys could check out freedomcells.org, that's one of the tools that we're using to create localized communities and to create more freedom. So, uh, and that's part of the decentralized process. Freedomcells.org. But, but thank you for that. Yeah. Anything else? All right. Thank you, guys.